Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue digging into these verses here in Daniel chapter 11. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things you do in our lives. And um, we are thankful for the time that we have to study together. So we lift up one another in prayer. We know that we are living in a very difficult time in our history. And um, there's things around us which we have no control over, but we know, Lord, that you oversee all events. And not just in the histories of ancient kingdoms, or the history of the Jews, but also in our personal lives and in this movement. And we are thankful for that. We ask for your spirit's presence as we open your word together. We ask that you can speak to us and teach us and guide us. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Now, I don't know how everyone else feels about like the study so far this week, but but I'm pretty happy with how we're working through things. And uh, we've had some good discussions and things that we still are uncertain about. And so we had done that review, and then we started looking at verse 23 and looking at the Jewish League. And, you know, we're starting to look at this this history, not just how it was originally uh, the original fulfillment, but also the applications to our time. And, and we are at some point going to draw these on a line, which I think are going to be very helpful. But for now, I, you know, I haven't chosen to do that. But we will. So so we looked at, uh, at finishing off yesterday. We looked at this after the league which is the Jewish League. We have 161 to 158 BC. Stephen has done a lot of research in that. And, um, whether, you know, Miller understood it correctly or not, um, we, we still have these dates, which I think we can, we can say are reliable. It's just that there's some uncertainty, uh, because there are different perspectives on how to understand what's written in Maccabees and also what Josephus says. And those are basically our main two sources for these dates. Um, so the, he's going to make this league with pagan Rome. So we look at the league. We see the parallel with spiritual formation at 9-11 um, that is done between the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Protestants. And this has to do with, of course, getting accreditation for our schools so that we can share ministers, basically. I'm not sure why why the Seventh-day Adventist Church would need the accreditation of um, something outside of the Adventist church. Uh, but I guess part of the idea is, you know, our ministers can go to other people's schools and the idea is other people can come to our schools. Other churches can come to our schools and, and get degrees. So, you know, these courses would then be transferable. And if somebody wants to become a minister, you know, if it's convenient, I guess, for them to go to an Adventist seminary, even if they're not an Adventist, they might do so but still uh, use those credits or whatever for uh, whatever seminary or that they're going to get their uh, ministerial degree in. So, so it just seems to me kind of an odd thing why Adventism has to do that, why we wouldn't just have schools for our own church, why we need one that's connected. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. That's what that, that league is. Um. And of course, um, he shall work deceitfully. So the idea here, and we have pagan Rome and spiritual formation for the Protestants, but if we have he, who is it, who is the he referring to? So we have, um, he makes uh, a league with pagan Rome. So pagan Rome, we're saying here, this has to do with spiritual formation of the Protestants. But would not he be the papacy in this case? that the papacy is working deceitfully through this spiritual formation in our history. So if we did this, does that make sense that even though the league is with the Protestants, that this is actually uh, the way that the papacy is working deceitfully, right? Because we can see that spiritual formation is something that comes from Catholicism. It's, it's adapted by Protestants, right? But really, it's it's idol worship, right? It's it's paganism. Um, so 
So this deceitfully is furthering the interests of papal Rome within Adventism, right? Because the whole idea that the papacy has is to bring these churches back to the mother, right? All of these daughters. And, and so this is one of the ways that they have done it, and they've done it in lots of different ways through the years. We know, of course, uh, Vatican II um, was really a move to um, to evangelize uh, other churches through through music and worship and different things. And these have all been gradually adopted by evangelicals. Okay. So he shall come up. So, of course, we know here that, that the hymn here is pagan Rome. So in, in this context, in 63 BC, uh, this is going to be Pompey, right? So we could probably put this here in just, then we'd have to figure out if he equals something in, in our history. So we wanted to think about what that that event would be that would mark this siege. So Pompey refers to something and, and there's this siege that goes on. She'll become strong with the small people. We talked about that there are different interpretations of this, either uh, referring to the Jews or just referring to um, the fact that Rome is, is uh, I don't know, a small people. So just not really sure how we would uh, address that. Do, do you have any ideas on that, Stephen? Can you explain about why the small people would refer to Rome itself? It just means a few or little. Well, I can just say what uh, Swearingen says. Yeah. So he says Rome would use the Jewish League uh, hold on. Yeah, to his advantage by working deceitfully to become strong. Well, he says actually with this small people, so I'm taking it it's actually, maybe he says it's the Jews. Yeah, he's, he applies it to the Jews. Yeah, 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 I'm just trying to remember on how he did it. I think he applied it to the Jews. Who applied it to Rome? Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith, okay. So Uriah Smith says, at this time, the Romans were small people. Ah. And began to work deceitfully or with cunning, as the word signifies. And from this point, they rose by a steady and rapid ascent to the height of power which they afterward attained. Okay. Now, um, what can we do possibly to, I mean, now the, the word people there is goy or goyim, right? Um, so it's often refers to the Gentiles or the nations, right? Um, yeah. Just, you know, I want to look here. wouldn't really apply to the Jews then. Yeah, that's, that's the thing is, it wouldn't generally apply to the to the Jews, so usually it refers to a foreign nation or a Gentile, but it, it can refer to, I, I think, the Jews at some time. Sometimes I think it is referenced to the Jews. I'm just trying to uh, see what I can do here. All right, so nations, nation, Gentiles, people. So the places where it's people, I don't see this here. All the people were passed clean over Jordan. So it can refer to Jews. It can be referred to people. And I'm just going to look at these here in Hebrew. Just hang on. Yeah, so there it's in the singular. And that's the thing I'm curious about with that one singular as well. So a small people, so it's singular. Normally, if you're going to have it as, so normally you're going to see it with the mem at the end when it's referring to the Gentiles. Okay, so so it could refer to the Jews. Now, the small just means few. Now, the idea that Uriah Smith is there is just sort of like a type of infiltration through through this contact. Is that the idea? Not that, that there's not very many Romans, but just that they do this with very few um, resources. It's not like through the military, you know, coming in. Um, so they're going to become strong with a small people. Strong uh, means to bind fast, to crunch the bones, break the bones, close, be great. So it's kind of an interesting <clears throat> idea. So anyway, um, the word strong there is very 
break the bones, to bind fast, that is to close the eyes intransitively to be causatively, to make power or powerful or numer numerous. So here, I mean, this could be, shall become strong, could refer to, especially in the context of a few people, um, because the word strong can mean to make numerous, like powerful, but in the sense of numerous, and with a small people. So that would sort of show this contrast. Um, yeah, I'm not sharing the screen. I don't know why. There we go. There we go. So, <clears throat> so this idea of strong, just show you here. Um, that's Goy. I need to get the other one. To be vast, numerous, be mighty. Right, so that's normally what it means. Now, there are different forms of the word. So the, the call form would be mighty or numerous. The hiffle form, to make strong, make mighty. So in this case, just going to look this up. Look at the Hebrew. See what form the word is in. So this is in the call, perfect, third person, masculine, singular. So this would really be to make numerous with a small people. So... How would that apply if we're saying that uh, he shall come up, right? Now, uh, this means to ascend, right, this idea. He's working, going to work deceitfully, right? So this is, of course, through this league. And he shall come up and shall become numerous with a small people. So could that possibly apply to the Jews? Wouldn't this make more sense to apply to the Romans? Well, I haven't heard any historians sort of relating that the Romans became numerous due to the Jews. I think that would be a difficult application. That, that Uriah Smith is using, or I can't remember which one is using which. Well, Swearingen, he, he applies small people to the Jews. Okay. Yeah, he does to the Jews. and Because the Jews were kind of on the fringe. I don't think they were that big of players in Rome becoming so numerous and successful. Yeah, so it make more sense that the small people is just the Romans coming into Jerusalem end up becoming numerous in Jerus in in Judea. But I don't know how numerous they would be in Judea. I don't know. I mean, obviously they're occupying it, but that would make more sense based on the meaning of the word strong. And the deceit, could you apply that to just that the Romans never, Roman never really uh, carried through with that league in the sense that Pompey is going to invade? Right. Yeah, so it's false. The word deceit, of course, fraud, craft, deceit, false, feigned, guile, subtlety, treachery. And that would basically describe what Rome ends up eventually doing. So they have this league. Um. But yeah, they never really follow through with it. It's going to be, um, obviously, I mean, it's a long time later, you know, different, different government in a sense, but yeah, it, so that's, but there is this type of deceit that, that Rome is using and not just with the Jews, but with others, right? So the idea is Rome offers this sort of uh, freedom or independence, but ultimately you still become part of the Roman Empire. And, you know, you're controlled by this this nation. But, I mean, it's not as bad as being in captivity to somebody like Babylon or Assyria, but it's still, they're conquered. Okay, so this, this league begins at 9-11. And, and what we'd have to try to understand is what, what these events are in our history. So we have the, the siege of Jerusalem. We put that as 63 when Jerusalem is conquered by Pompey. Well, that's the small people. It does not apply to the Jews in that first then. Could we then, would that not be an argument then saying, well, it doesn't apply to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, the lead does. But the idea is that Rome is becoming strong through this infiltration. So the small people to me would be the idea of infiltration within the church. That's the way that I would understand it. So he's going to come up with a small people, right, to do this. In this league, his deceitful work is this work of infiltration. Because if you think about a few people 
I mean, did the Seventh Day Adventist Church get conquered by, um, you know, after it made this league, did it get conquered by, you know, an overt takeover of the Seventh Day Adventist Church by the Protestant churches and the Catholic Church? No, it's it's not something done through infiltration. So I'm just thinking of the small people as, you know, sort of those that have infiltrated the church and undermined it. Does that that make sense? Um, now, one of the things, too, if I take if I take these these numbers, so I took the word small people, I added it together. It's uh, six thousand and sixty three. Is the number. And and I thought, well, where would I count that from? I'd count it from nine eleven. And where it's going to bring me to is the first day of the first month in 2018. So that's April 18th, 2018. So that's going to be 6,063 days after September 11th. Now, as a symbol, of course, we already have the first day of the first month. Does that give us any, any clue as to how that is connected? Does that just... I mean, you're going to take a number, you're going to find some connections. Is that enough of a connection to say that there's any meaning in that by connecting it to the first day of the first month in 2018? So in 2018, remember, that's going to be the year that we uh, are going to begin this time setting. So it, it brings us to that that year. And we already have connections between September 11th and the first day of the first month as a symbol, right? So the fact that we can connect September 11th to the first day of the first month in 2018 might have significance. But I don't know how it helps us necessarily establish, you know, the meaning of a small people. But we know in that history in 2018, we have infiltration, not directly, you know, we, I'm, I'm not saying that Parminder is a, uh, a Jesuit spy, but definitely he has bought into uh, a lot of ideas that come from Rome. And so in that year that begins on the first day of the first month, which is April 18th, 2018, in that year, uh, we're going to have uh, that time setting coming in. I don't know if there's some date in, in our movement's history or some other history, uh, the church or, or whatever on April 18th uh, in 2018, but we have that symbol there. Um, so that could show some of this um, infiltration. Yeah, so minorities, maybe. Small people being minorities. So so anyway, what that would do, it'd be what that small people would do with the numbers there, would sort of connect 9-11 with what's going to happen in 2018. But, you know, maybe there's some specific event that happens April 18th, uh, 2018. But none that I know of. Uh, I'm trying to think back, back then. I mean, I know Parmender has some meetings in Canada in April of 2018. Was it Parmender or Tess or I'm trying to remember who comes in 2000? It's not Tess. Anyway, there's some meetings there, um, but I don't know the dates of them. I could try to find it, I guess. But the symbol of the first day of the first month obviously comes into play. A lot. So, you know, any thoughts on that? Okay. I know I got an email from Kelly on uh, April 18th regarding these uh, notes for that, those meetings. I'm just looking at this. Yeah. So they had it from April 15th to 29th. So there's, so it doesn't mark April 15th specifically. I'm just seeing though which day I went to it. Um, I think I was there, I think at the end of it, I don't know, 15th to 29th. They had like two weeks of it. April 18th is the Wednesday, so first Wednesday in those meetings. Anyway, I know I'm just kind of rambling here trying to figure this out, but we can sort of, we can say that at least at this time, and we have the first day of the first month being marked there. That um, that this this whole thing, verse twenty three, is referring to this infiltration that happens within uh, Adventism, but also within this movement, right? Because it happens within in uh, 
Judea and, and Jerusalem. And, and this is the result of this league. Now, as far as this league itself, um, like the word, uh, 266, 2066, 2066. Um, is there anything about that uh, number? So we deal with the league. Two 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 six six. Pardon me. Anything we can do with that? You know, it's thirty. It's thirty four less than twenty three hundred. Okay. So one thing we can say about it, if we go to, um, so if we go from Jeff's birthday in two thousand ten. So I'm just going to use this as an example. November seventh, two thousand ten. Uh, how old's Jeff going to be in 2010? That's that's going to be the day I meet Jeff, by the way. November 7th, 2010. He's uh, 59. 59, because he, so he's born in 41, right? Is that what you're saying? No, 51. 51, okay, right there, yeah, 51. So that's the day I meet Jeff. And if I count from that date, 2266, I get uh, the inauguration of Trump on January 20th, 2017. So, I mean, that's just the symbol of the word, the league. Now, does that have any application if we're going to talk about the league? Or is that just, you know, it just happens the day that I meet Jeff, which is his birthday, that's going to be in Oklahoma, and we count 2266, and it brings us to January 20th, 2017. So maybe that has some meaning. Maybe it doesn't. I mean, obviously, we could put it to other January 20th, right? So wouldn't necessarily from November 7th. Um, so maybe there's some other application we could have of this league. If we went from September 11th, so let's go. It's going to bring us to November 25th, you know, as a date. Uh, 2007 doesn't really mean anything as far as I can see. So I don't know. So that's just, again, another another number that we could look at. I think there was another thing. Uh, was it? Yeah, if we added uh, the league made with him, so if we added made with, I don't know if that would really make sense. Um, but if we did add it, it, it would go from uh, generally in most years from February 11th to, which is Stephen's birthday to Trump's birthday, June 14th. But I don't know if that has any relevance. Okay, so so there were some symbols here that we're still going to take time to look at, and maybe as we start to put these on a line and we start to put dates there, um, those will be a bit more helpful. Now, it says he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that, which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter them among the prey and and spoil and riches, yea, he shall forecast his devices from the strongholds or against the strongholds, but from the strongholds in uh, our understanding of it, even for a time. So we have some symbols here dealing with time. Every time we have that word time, uh, we take note of it. And uh, this historically, you know, I should go to the other document because we can look at that. So we probably should put some of this stuff here, so the small people, they, here I have Judeo-Palestine, so that would refer to the people of the Jews. But here we're going to say that this small people refers to the Romans through infiltration, we'll call it. And this is, of course... Um, that part is not making sense to me. Okay, what part is not? Romans through infiltration. Yeah, so the small people are yeah, the Rome coming through infiltration. Am I doing something wrong? I, I think you've got it. I mean, the, I, I still, I'm looking at that, that the small people would be more the, the smaller groups that the, the Romans took over because they would go in to a lot of these small groups and give them an offer that, you know, they would come to their aid when needed. Okay. But this is singular. So it's not peoples. And, and the idea here is that Rome is going to become numerous with a small people, right? That's, that's the idea of strong. So, so this really is numerous. I, I'd place your equal sign then 
equal like well, here? Well, yeah, sixty one hundred five equals numerous, right? Yeah, I wouldn't put an equal there though. All right, just the way I do it. It's just defining that word. Okay, fine. <clears throat> okay, so numerous, and so these, so the small people. It's either the people that they're they're becoming strong against that they're coming up against, or it's there are small people that they're using to come up against others, right? In this case, uh, this has to do with, I mean, obviously they're infiltrating, infiltrating, uh, are coming up against the Jews, right? So they're entering, because in 63, because it says he shall come up. So they have entered Judea, Syria in 64, 63. So they're going to conquer Jerusalem in 63. That's going to be Pompey. And then shall become strong. They're going to become numerous. Now with the small people. Now part of the um, the idea here too is um, so we have with. So in uh, the Hebrew here, right, because you can see they get all of these extra words being added. And uh, so what they do is they put a, a bet, that's the letter B sound, at the beginning of this word ma'at. So ma'at means little or few, right? And and then they put a, a bet. Now, the, the bet as a prefix usually refers to in, right? So they translated it here as with, right? So the bet prefix usually, it, and it, it's a preposition, right? So it can be in, it can be with, and it can be at, okay? So when it's attached to the beginning of the word as a prefix, that's that's what it means. So it can be translated with, right? But just to note that it could also be translated in, okay? That makes sense? So they shall become numerous in a small people. Okay, or that has that has a different connotation. Right, exactly. So so deciding whether it's with or at, you know, we're putting it into English. In Hebrew, I mean, obviously they're not thinking that it has different meanings, if you understand what I mean, right? Like they just see that bet at the beginning of the word and they have a way in which they understand their language. And then we have to put it in, how, how do we understand that in English? But the idea of a bet is it's it's actually a short form of another word, which means within, right? But often they just add the bet to the word instead of adding the whole word. I can't remember what it is, um, but it's a bit longer word. But I, I can't even think. I could I could look it up, but um, so they add the bet, and and that's the main idea of it that it's in a small people. Now this idea of in that they have in Hebrew could include. The, the word with that we have in English, but we just have some more, more distinctions in those prepositions, right? So, but if we took it that way, we could take it that they're going to become numerous in this small nation of Judea or Jerusalem, whatever you want to call it, Judah. Does that make sense? So there is that, that, uh, that sense there. And, and that would make sense, right? I would agree. Anyone else with comments on that, Stephen or anyone? Yeah, certainly another option to consider. Yeah, because we could just take this word people as meaning nation, so within a small nation, right? I think that's that's more relevant to what we're talking about. Yeah. So this would just be more Rome's infiltration of of the land of Israel, right? So I don't know, maybe infiltration isn't the right word here because it becomes numerous. Um, but this is really how it, it, it conquers Judah. Now, uh, the other thing about uh, being numerous, I mean, when we think about, um, I mean, I, I wasn't there at the time, but when you read the scriptures, I mean, it seems that Rome has definitely the Roman culture is all around the Jews in Jerusalem. 
I don't know the number of Romans to Jews in in the first century. It's probably a hard thing to know exactly the demographics. You say in Jerusalem, there's between 35,000 and 70,000 people during the reign of Herod. That's in Jerusalem itself, of course. So I don't know if anybody really knows the demographics um, of the land of Palestine there. There was the Romans there. It would be really those who would be military. Well, there's definitely a lot of military. That's what I want to know is, that, are there Romans living there? I mean, it's a province of Rome. How many Romans would live there? That's the thing I'm, I'm kind of interested in. Um, so, you know, the idea of them becoming numerous, what does that mean? Yeah, I wouldn't think there would be a great deal. Obviously, there would be Romans there, but more more as traders yeah. rather than people who dwelt there. Yeah, I mean, you'd obviously have all the administration uh, there, right? Um, so you got the people, who obviously, but they, they use a lot of the national people, like tax collectors, to collect taxes would be Jews, right? Um, which is why they were so hated. They were like traitors or something. Um, but that's the idea of, of numerous, right? So, so numerous with the small people. So we have two different things. They become with... A, they're a small people, and they become numerous. So that would be the small people then would refer to the Romans, or it could refer to right the, the small people being the Jews or the small nation, right? That ends up being overrun, so to speak, by Romans, and and that's what we don't know. So I mean, I think all we could do is guess at this point until we get some some information that tells us what was actually happening in Judea, in, in the land of Palestine, as far as was there Roman settlements and so forth, or was it really still just a Jewish country that was just controlled by Rome with, you know, the soldiers and all that type of stuff? So uh, I don't know. I mean, I know the Romans seem to be everywhere. How many Romans are in? You know, like the Romans that we do know about, we have a centurion, right? Obviously, he's a military guy. But I don't know if there'd be a lot of businessmen who live there. There'd be traders, of course. Um, you know, different people would have businesses there or do business there. But it's not really clear, right? So at least we can say that much. I think after the uh, Bar Kokhba rebellion, I think around 135, AD, around that time. And yeah. then they changed, they changed the name of Jerusalem to another, like a Roman name. Okay. Kind of like something Capita or something. And uh, I think the plan there was to have Jerusalem being a Roman city. Okay. That they were going to populate it with a lot of Romans, but it never really... Was, okay. There was a so, failure. Okay, so one of the things, though, that we can say is that eventually, even though they don't make it a Roman city, they wanted to. I mean, there's this small nation that they conquer, right? They come in <clears throat> first with this league, uh, then they come up with an army, conquer Jerusalem. And, and this small nation, I mean, the Romans become numerous, right? Doesn't necessarily mean they outnumber the Jews, but at some point in history, um, it's just part of the Roman Empire and the Jewish nation itself, obviously with the destruction of the temple. And you're saying the the Bar Kokhba, however you say that, rebellion in what, 135, did you say, AD? Yes. Okay. And so that this can refer to events that are going to happen afterwards, right? But that's just one option. So we still have these options open, what it means. Now he shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province, right? Syria, Judea, and Egypt is what Swearingen, I believe, puts in there. And then we'd have this, this description of he shall do that which his fathers have not done, or his father's fathers. And we put that as Titus's destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And then the scattering among them, the prey, the spoil, the riches. This is the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem. 
and then he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time, right? So this we put uh, as 360 years from 31 BC to 30 AD. So, so in what we, what we discussed before is that in this, these two verses is sort of this package of what ends up happening with this league. And this league then, um, brings us to the dispersion of the Jews and finally to, uh, Rome moving its capital from, uh, Rome, right? So the Roman Empire moving its capital from the city of Rome to Constantinople, right? And that's why it's, um, forecasting his devices from the strongholds, right? So the idea here, uh, is that this equals from, I shouldn't put it that way. I should put it this way. You don't worry. I want the equals always between the the black bolded uh, historic one and the red uh, present truth one. So, um, and we have here in these words uh, the devices. Um, mak, makash haba, and it means a contrivance or a machine, right? So we talked about that. This is like a machine, a plot, and forecast means to. Uh, now that's kashab, right? And that means, uh, literally or properly to plate, um, to weave, right? To fabricate, to plot. And so it's a, and it deals with a, a plot or contrive, right? So the only difference between these two words, obviously the Hebrew numbers are quite different, right? Forecast, uh, being, uh, 2803. And devices being 4284, but they're actually related words. Basically, the difference is there's a mem at the beginning of the word devices. So a mem is a prefix. And, um, so that just changes the word, but it, the, the main root of this is this, um, chasab, right? So that's a, Chet, a shin, and a bet. And if you look at devices, it's going to have uh, a mem. And then it's going to have the chet, the shin, and the bet. And it has an h at the end. So this is just um, the pluralizing. It's a masculine plural of this. So his devices are his machinery. So he's going to plot with his plotting machines. And then this word against... <clears throat> Al means upon, on the ground of, according to, on account of, on behalf of, concerning, beside, in addition to, together, above, over, by, on, towards, to, against. It has lots of different meanings that we put from. It doesn't, it's not normally translated as from, right? But the idea of, of, of the word, um, that is upon the strongholds or the idea of being this strongholds here is a fortification or a cap a castle. So is he plotting his plots um, against some fortification for a time, or is he doing it upon this fortification? That is in the sense of from it. Now, one way it could be translated on behalf of, but the idea of against, it doesn't really generally have that sense of like coming against a, like if we look at this word here, um, here, I guess I'll go so you can see what I'm looking at. So there's the word. And if we go to the King James Concordance, you're going to see uh, he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hoba. Right. So this this idea here, the context of this Genesis 14, 15. Um, Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. He armed and trained his servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. He divided himself against them. Now, it's kind of interesting. He divided himself against them, right? So he's he's dividing his group of people against them, right? So it could have been translated other ways. 
could be because of them or concerning them, right? So lots of different ways in which it could be translated. It looks like uh, like we have it in over Genesis 8, verse 1. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. So there you got the same word as against. So you can see passing, obviously not against the earth, in the sense of a military conflict or anything. Genesis 6, 1, um, came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and his daughters were born unto them. So the word on is that same word that's translated as against, right? Or over, or on the face of the earth. So you can see how this could be cast, forecasting his devices um, over the fortress or from that fortress in that sense as a, not directly from, as we would think of the word from, but in that place. Okay. So, so that's, that's, you know, a basic interpretation that we have of this this scripture, uh, Daniel chapter 11, um, verse 24, is that the idea is that this is from Rome, right? So that's going to be Uriah Smith. So any comments on this? Are we going to accept this understanding that we've had for a long time? Are we going to question it? Right. So he says Thomas Newton gives the thought of forecasting devices from strongholds instead of against them. This the Romans did from the strong fortress of the seven hilled city, even for a time. Doubtless refers to a prophetic time, 360 years. From what point are these years to be dated? Probably from the event brought to view in the following verse. Right. So the Battle of Actium. So are we going to accept that that interpretation then? Because if we're going to have it for a time, um, we're, we're obviously going to use that. And, and the only reason this would end is you're going to have the capital move. So we could say, so we say here, strongholds um, cast his devices upon the strongholds. So I think, because uh, this is Swearingen, so he must be saying that this is just referring to the his devices is this persecution. We've taken this position that this strongholds is Rome, city of Rome. Okay, so does this, we're going to have more discussion on this? Well, basically, are you just accepting your ass miss understanding? Well, Thomas Newton's understanding, uh, as far as being from the city of Rome. Father's place is equating to Egypt. And uh, you would actually... So you had issues with, uh, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers, mm -hmm. which was to share the acquisitions and benefits of conquests with other lands. Yeah. So is that not, is that not okay? Well, so the idea here is that what uh, what is what he's done is that neither his fathers nor his father's fathers uh, have done is the destruction of Jerusalem. And so I'm taking the scattering among them, the prey, the spoil, and the riches um, is not among the people that he's conquered. But scattering these people, it's, this is the dispersion of the Jewish nation uh, after uh, the destruction of the temple. So that was where in Jesus Yes. So he's going to have that sort of view dealing with it. But I just had trouble with the idea that this was just how they conquered. I think that was Uriah Smith's just the way in which they conquered. Yeah. And so we get this thing called the diaspora that happens after 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's what I think it refers to. That's my opinion. Whatever that's worth. So what we had here, what they are going to do is destroy Jerusalem. Right. So we know that that didn't happen with the different uh, sieges and interactions with the Jews. They never destroyed the city. Titus is going to do that. And so he's he going to do that. What's that? That would be the he. He shall do that which his fathers have not done. So that would be Titus. Yes. Yep. That's going to be Titus. 
and, and, and in a sense, it's Titus, but it's also just referring to Rome itself. But it's going to be through Titus. So whether he refers to, to just to pagan Rome, which is what I think it, it sort of refers to. Um, so he's going to do something that he had never done before. It's going to be through Titus that that occurs. So, so the he loosely does refer to Titus, but I think it more overall just has to do with pagan Rome. So, so one of the things that we have here in, in this translation is, is we have this, again, we have a few Hebrew words that are put into an English sentence. So you have the word, he shall scatter, right? Nine, six, seven. Um, among them, the, the prey, they're going to use just the one Hebrew word, nine, six, one, and then spoil, seven, nine, nine, eight, and riches, seven, three, nine, nine. So to understand that sentence in Hebrew, right, or in English from translating in Hebrew, we have to add words, right? So we have to kind of understand what is being said. So the idea to scatter among them the prey. So I'm going to um, just do a quick analysis here. So the, the word scatter, it's just your verb. It's the cal imperfect. Um, uh, so it just means it's in the incomplete tense. Um, third person masculine singular. So he shall scatter, right? That's the third person masculine. And it's just one person. It's not, you know, you know, them. And, and then it's going to have, uh, uh, a consecutive vav. So that's a vav and then the al. And, and, um, now that number for some reason, let me see here. So for some reason, there's a word that the King James doesn't even include. So there is a word, and I'm just trying to make sure that I'm actually seeing this correctly. So they have here just those four words in the King James. So you can see I have them numbered. Um, and as far as uh, the word among, right, we don't see any number for it. Yeah, so you can see here you've got... It's going to have the scatter, the prey, the spoil, and the riches. But in the Hebrew, it actually has another word that's not included in the King James uh, numbers in in um, the Bible that we have online. So not sure why. And I'm going to just take a look, try to figure out what's going on. That word against in chapter in um, verse verse 24. That you was, that you had, yeah, five fifty eight fifty nine twenty one, yeah, uh, five nine two one, yeah, yeah. That where I got the uh, strong concordance, and they don't show no number behind it against. You're saying that you don't see that word there? No, I see the word, but you don't see his number behind it. Like that five, that fifty nine twenty one. The concordance yeah. I'm using online. Okay. okay, well, I'm not sure why. I, I can't tell you why it doesn't happen. Because because it's there. It's there in the Hebrew. So. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's it's got a, a vav there, vav al, some vav al. So I'm just trying to figure out why they don't have this this other word here. This doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm going to try to figure this out. Sorry about that. I mean, I can show you what I'm looking at. <laughs> so this is uh, Scholar's Gateway. So with Scholar's Gateway, I can I can take a look at these different words, right? And I just hold the mouse over them, right? That's going to be father, right? It shows the form of the word, right? Father is an individual, right? And then it's going to show that it's a noun, masculine, plural. Right. And then you're going to see, um, um, again, fathers, a masculine plural noun, just a different form. And then you're going to have um, another masculine, just again, fathers, your father and your father's fathers. Uh, so it's got these things here that is at the end that means your. 
and then it's going to have uh, bitsa, feminine singular root, that's the spoil, right? So that's 961. And then you're going to have sha'al, the sha'al it says, but it's sha'al, that's the, the prey, could be translated as spoil as well, plunder. And then it's going to have um, uh, the property, the goods, the possessions, right? So it's going to have this number 7399. And then it's going to have lachem. Now it's just a proposition that's them. And uh, uh, sort of, um, so this would be the one that's among them, I would think, right? So it doesn't have a number. And then it's going to say to scatter, right? So the scatter is at the end. And then you got uh, 5922. So they have this instead of 5921, upon, over, on account of, above, to, against, right? So that's the one against um, the fortress. So it's this word here, lachem, that, that is, doesn't have a number attached to it, right? So this is this word, right? If I click on this, it'll do, just says it's a preposition. Now, so it's, so what is a preposition? Because they're going to use it to say among them, right? So it's going to scatter among them uh, the spoil and the prey. And, and what is that justified by the text is, I guess, what I'm, I'm asking. Because that's part of this interpretation. Scattering among them the spoil and the prey. That it's being shared. That's Uriah Smith. Right? He's going to, right? Because literally in Hebrew they have the prey, the spoil, the riches, uh, he shall scatter, right? That's the way they put it in Hebrew. That's the word order. But here, among them, the prey, we have to figure out why it says in the King James, among them. Because the idea here is that they're going to conquer. This is Uriah Smith. They're going to conquer. And when they conquer, they're going to share the spoil and the booty to the people they conquer, which doesn't really make much sense. You're going to just take it from them and give it back. Maybe take it from the poor, give it to the rich. I don't know. Okay. To answer, to answer your question from just a moment ago. Okay. Prepositions would indicate relationships between other words in a given sentence, Mm -hmm. but they're usually a very small, very common word that can show direction, location, time, or that introduces a specific object. Right. So they, they're quite versatile little things. They're just part of our, our grammar. Right. Okay. So the idea that this is, that there is any indication that, that they're scattering among them, the prey, the spoil, the riches, that's not really in the Hebrew, Right. It could indicate direction. And so they might say, well, that's the direction is going to be among them. But the idea is just that they're going to scatter it, like not among them. They're going to scatter the people. Right. But what what if this is actually to, you know, a, a reference to about scattering the prey? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's scattering the prey, the spoil and the riches. So all of those things of Jerusalem are then going to be, with the destruction of Jerusalem, be scattered throughout the empire, including the people. So it's not scattering this among them. This is just the scattering of them, right? That is so the people and, and, and the spoil and the riches within the Roman Empire that happens with the destruction of Jerusalem. But whose riches are being scattered? Those of Jerusalem. Does that mean God's blessings are being scattered? Well, I guess you could say that too. But, you know, Jerusalem is destroyed and the people are scattered and the spoil is scattered and the riches are scattered, right? That's, that's I mean, that's just the, the literal thing of what happens. And, and so that's with the destruction of Jerusalem. So it, they're not scattering it among them. That's sort of my point. There's nothing in the Hebrew that would support that translation. So what I would normally do when, when I find something that, that they have done to sort of explain the sentence, you know, normally you would say, you know, it's always 
in um, in italics, right? That's sort of what we kind of are taught. If it's not in the text, it's in italics. But that's not actually the case. There's lots of words that are needed to be added, right? So, I mean, and we don't have a Hebrew number for that word that there that that preposition is, right? So it's not not even considered as a Hebrew number, lachem. But we would say that they're going to scatter this. So I just crossed out among them. So he that is Rome, you could say Titus or the Roman emperor, whatever we want to say, he's going to scatter the prey, those are the Jews, the spoil, and the riches, right? So this is the disper- dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem, sometimes referred as the diaspora or diaspora, however you say it. <clears throat> Probably diaspora, but anyway. And then yay, right? So again, you have a word, yay, this is just a vav, right? It's just, I don't know why they put, you know, they're just trying to make it into good English. Um, but you can see that they just, in, in the King James, it's just an added. So it's not even a word. It's just, they're just taking the sense of this is something that's uh, connected to what just is said, right? So yay, he shall get, shall forecast his devices or plot his, uh, plot his plottings, his plottings upon over from the strongholds, even for a time, 360 years. So I, I think this makes the most sense. And, and then it's going to say, you know, Rome has done this to the Jews, but they're going to be doing this from Rome up until 330. Right. So when Constantine moves, moves the capital. So this brings us all the way up up to that period of time. So the high idea here is that these this group of verses that this is actually and I'm going to change this here a little bit because this is actually a different group gives us a line where this group is is going to give us another line. So this is going to be 25 to 29 probably. Right? Because this is going to go back again to the Battle of Actium, right? So this one brings us to the end of that history. And then the next verse is going to give us the start of that period going from the Battle of Actium, right, to, to 330. So it's just going to give us this Battle of Actium. So it, it's repeating and enlarging. So the idea is that we don't just have this continuous chronological flow in Daniel chapter 11, as some people assume that it will go back and refer to things earlier. So there's a grouping here, and this is this is really about the Jewish League and the results, right? And the nation that does it, it's going to move its capital from Rome to Constantinople. So there's this persecution that's going to happen from the fortress of Rome. It's now going to move from Rome to Constantinople. And then in verse 25, well, it's going to go back... Uh, it, well, based on what he, we have here, this is going to be the Battle of Actium. It's going to go back to Octavian and Mark Antony, right? And um, that battle that goes on between Octavian or Augustus and Cleopatra and Mark Antony, right? So in 31 AD, they have the Battle of Actium. And, it, and it's it's kind of weird because a Mark Antony doesn't really realize that he lost the battle when he leaves because he didn't realize that all of his ships are going to surrender and that his soldiers, uh, where he had left them back at Actium, uh, they're going to all just um, a defect over to Octavian. So, so really he is defeated, but it, it's not evident to him that he has been defeated until he flees. When him and Cleopatra flee, well, nobody stays loyal to him. You know, the army and, and the Navy don't, right? And so, and then we get into these, uh, so we'll come back to that. Um, some of the stuff we'll look at tomorrow and probably next week in more detail. So both these kings, Octavian, Antony, right? Heart shall be due to do mischief. They would both desire control of the Roman world. They shall speak lies at one table, form false alliances, but it shall not prosper. These agreements would last, for yet at the end shall be at the time appointed, right? Antony would be defeated in 31 BC and commit suicide in, and I don't know why, I just, I don't have the date there, just at BC, so he's going to, whatever, whenever he commits suicide, 
I don't know. I'll probably just get rid of this. I know it's going to happen shortly after. So, And then he, Octavian, later Caesar Augustus, returns into his own land with great riches and his pagan and his pagan Rome's Octavian's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, Christianity, Judea, and Palestine. He shall do exploits, persecute Christians, settle the Eastern ter- territories, and return it to his own land. So, which is going to be Rome. So you can see that this is this is definitely going back. Um, probably we could, uh, I'm not sure why we have these different, yeah, so we're going to have, let's see, I would probably divide these sections differently. Any thoughts about any of this at this point? Does this seem reasonable, the, the, the historic application of these verses? I think we're still working through it. Okay. I mean, this is what, this is basically what we've been given. I don't think there's much difference here between Swearingen and, uh, Uriah Smith. I mean, we have the Battle of Actium. We have the death. We have, now the speaking lies at one table. How have we understood this in, in verse 28 or 27? I always looked at that as being similar to diplomacy. Okay. But we, we made an application of it in our history. Jeff did. Yes, I know. So, so where was he placing this? One of his comments had to deal with, uh, his dealing with Parminder regarding future for America. Right. Yeah. So, so he, he makes an application there dealing with Parminder. Now, of course, that's going to be later, right? So initially, right. when he makes an application, you know, back in 2016, I mean, this is going to have to do with, uh, with who? What? I mean, who's it going to be? Now, if he's, if he's having this as Octavian, well, Octavian is Caesar Augustus, he would be Obama, right? Okay. Right. So, so I, I can't remember specifically how he looked at it, but it had something to do with that, with that history. But I don't know what he did with, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed, right? As far as making a present truth application. So, you know, so if this historic application is correct, uh, we still have made different applications to our history. And of course, in order to get a proper application to our history, one of the first things we have to do is make sure the historic application is correct. So if this is referring to Octavian, that is going to be Obama, you know, I mean, how would we apply this whole battle of Actium? I mean, to what would we apply it? Right. So that's part of the uh, the issue. Right. We have to figure out what, what events are being described here. And, you know, who is Cleopatra going to represent? Egypt. Well, Egypt would represent the UN, right? The world. But it's Egypt and Cleopatra being under Mark Antony. So we have a woman who usually represents a church. We have Mark Antony. Who does he represent? Right. So you, you can see some of the problems as we start to look at this historical application. There are many things we have to sort out. And, and I think what we had done in the past is we sort of picked certain things that we applied, but there wasn't a consistent application of, of, of that history. So looking at that history first, we just kind of accepted whatever was given to us. I don't think there was a lot of thought as far as going beyond Uriah Smith in the interpretation of Daniel chapter 11. Um, and you know, part of what I, what I see, like even with swearing, uh, what he, what he has done is, you know, he's aware of the past interpretations of something and he finds little differences here and there, right? So there are going to be things that he sees, well, he's going to interpret it differently, but you know, and so, like sometimes he's going to have a tie kiss epiphanies in places I don't think he should have. And so there's a few different things. But it's not a, a really a deep, deep examination of it, right? It's, it's sort of taking what's there and finding little things that are different. And I think the approach that we're using is much more uh, getting down to brass tacks in, in studying these things, right? 
One is we're making connections that other people have not made. And, and so there could be things here in these verses that we just, that will actually open this up a bit more, right? So in these verses here, I mean, we can see that there's, there's things that fit in the historic interpretation, but maybe there's things that we have to see more clearly if we're going to make a present truth application. You know, so the idea of these, both these kings' hearts shall do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table. So this is, you know, the, this false alliance between Octavian and Antony. I mean, which definitely is, because uh, I've studied the history now a little bit. I mean, they're not even really in communication with each other very much. You know, Antony's over in the east, Octavian's over in the west, right? They're, um, so... So their agreement's not going to last. So, I mean, to that to me definitely seems like it fits. But yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So we know this this time appointed, we had, well, even for a time. And, and that's one of the things that we have to figure out is this time appointed. I need to add the Hebrew in here, too, before the next study. Okay. So anyway, we're going to stop there. We're going to look at these verses tomorrow. I'm hoping next week that we can start to draw some of this out on a line. We'll see how far we get, because I've moved a bit slower than I expected. Okay, so let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love, and we ask for your blessing upon this day and upon our continued study of these verses. Uh, be with each person. May your Holy Spirit watch over us. Let your angels protect us. And may you be with those that we love and care for. And help us to be an influence to those that we meet. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.